Rachel Krause with The Daily Wire. Today we have Allie Stuckey, the conservative millennial and host of Allie on CRTV. Allie, it's great to have you join us. Thanks for having me. Thanks for making time for us today. Uh, we got a lot of things to talk about today. Lots of breaking news these last couple of weeks. It, there's never been a dull moment, that's for sure. No, never. It makes our jobs fun and exciting, though. <laughs> we don't have to talk about, you know, paint drying or something. Exactly. So recent polling has shown that the majority of millennials, like you and I, unfortunately, view socialism in a positive light. Is there anything that conservatives can do to reverse this trend? I think some of it is generational and honestly, the farther away that we get from the Great Depression and the World Wars, the less we know about what it's like to go without and the importance of deferred gratification and uh, the value of a dollar and work ethic. Uh, we're just kind of far removed from the days when those things were absolutely necessary to survive, which is why we've been coddled so much by prosperity and success, which is a good thing, but it's of course a double-edged sword. So when you look at it in that historical sense, it's kind of a daunting task for a conservatives and Republicans to uh, try to combat. I mean, we have generations and generations that have kind of built up to this. However, I really think that the biggest thing these days uh, that appeals to millennials about socialism is the perceived compassion and empathy that we're seeing. I mean, hmm. we saw uh, the the young lady, I always forget her last name, Ocasio-Cortez, I think is her last name, that uh, just won in the 14th district in New York. And the way that she came across was not that she knows a lot about economics or not that she knows a ton about policy, but that she was very empathetic to people who were different than her, that she was going to fight on their behalf. Take care of them. And I think that's, mm -hmm. yes, exactly. And I think that's what Republican, uh, Republicans can do a better job of communicating, because if we believe that conservatism is good for you, it's good for me, then we do believe it's good for everyone. We believe that it's good for, you know, the mom with three kids who's on welfare. We believe that it's good for the homeless person. We believe that it's really the only vehicle to prosperity and success and liberty um, is this idea of self-governance and liberty and pulling yourself up by your bootstraps. So I think we can do a better job of telling stories of the testimonies of how conservatism and you know small government and lower taxes, deregulation has actually led to prosperity and show that that's, the actu that's actually the empathetic stance to take, not so. So what do you say then to those millennial leftists that say, well, if the government does it, then who will? Um, I would look at the statistics that show that America is exceedingly generous, um, exceedingly generous as a nation. And also, we never hear about uh, the organizations that are doing this without any government help. For example, here in Dallas, where I live, there is an organization called Clean Slate that offers jobs, uh, manual labor jobs for homeless people in the community, helps them, you know, just make a little bit of money to get on their feet and really, most importantly, gain their dignity. What socialists seem to not understand is that there is no dignity when you don't own your private property and when you're not really genuinely working for something, which uh, Ocasio-Cortez, what she wants is guaranteed federal jobs. Well, that's just creating a superficial job that's not actually necessary. And human beings are savvy enough to know um, that if they're not necessary, then they really have, you know, they have no meaning. They have no real fulfillment. And so to me, socialism denies the very real uh, innate characteristics of human nature. And that's not only to own private property, uh, but also to work for something. And, uh, you know, socialism just doesn't allow that to happen. Yep. So now we have Justice Kennedy retiring. It's the big news. And the left is, of course, galvanizing their base by saying that, yes. you know, the fifth conservative justice will mean the reversal of Roe v. Wade and apparently the end of the world as we know it. Uh, didn't you know that you and I are living right. in Handmaid's Tale? Because that's what I learned this last week. Yes. <laughs> yes. I feel very oppressed, even more oppressed now. So do you actually see, and I know lots of conservatives like our very own Michael Knowles is, is touting that this will mean the reversal of Roe versus Wade. Do you see that happening? Um, I think it's absolutely a possibility. And of course, as someone who is adamantly pro-life, I'm very optimistic and, and hopeful for that. But um, even as someone who desperately wants to see Roe v. Wade overturned, uh, I think that we need to be careful not to say, you know, I want someone to be on the Supreme Court who is going to overturn Roe v. Wade. That's not the qualification for me. The qualification is that they are an originalist, that they, um, you know, fear in a healthy way the Constitution, that they are a constitutionalist. Mm -hmm. And I think 
that overturning Roe v. Wade could be a consequence of that. But that's not the number one thing that I'm looking for. Um, even though I've tweeted as much, I've said, you know, just watch out. We're going to overturn Roe v. Wade because that's what I want. But that's not my number one characteristic that I want as a, in a Supreme Court judge. The most important thing I want is upholding the Constitution. Mm -hmm. And if Roe v. Wade is a consequence of that, which I think it very well could be, then I'm happy. But I think it also speaks to the fact that the left has to know that Roe v. Wade is constitutionally precarious. Yeah. If it wasn't, if it was such settled law, as they said, if it really couldn't be overturned, then they wouldn't be freaking out right now. But they have to know it was a pretty bad decision. And that's why it's so well, what's so funny to me, though, is how they want to say that things like this are settled law. But then they also want us to claim that the Constitution is a living and breathing document that can mean whatever we want it to mean. So it's right. like, pick a side. Right. Well, so what is it? that's because they believe that their subjective mm -hmm. opinions are settled law. It has nothing to do with the Constitution. So based on you talking about you want a strict constitutionalist and orig uh, original List, who on uh, President Trump's shortlist are, are you favoring right now? So I, well, I've heard Mike Lee, which I think is great. I don't think, I'm not really sure that that's going mm -hmm. to happen. Um, but his latest pick that we've heard a lot of hubbub about on CNN, um, her name, of course, I only know her first name, which makes me a sexist. Um, it's Amy and then Coney she has Barrett. Two last names. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Um, I really like her. Of course, everyone on the left is saying, oh, it's just because she's a pretty woman. Mm -hmm. It's just because of the appearance of him wanting, of Trump wanting CNN's to, CNN's own you know, Chris Eliza said that yesterday. He insinuated that because Trump cares about exactly. looks that he would pick her, which is just uh, beyond sexist. But of course, he won't be called out for it. Of course. And she's extremely qualified. Mm -hmm. So I, I, she's not necessarily my favorite pick just because she's a woman. Although, yeah, I do. I think it would be cool to have the first conservative female justice. Sure, that would be awesome if she is the most qualified. But from what I have read about her, she does seem very qualified. Mm -hmm. So I'm glad that she's at least in the running. And she would be there for a long time. Presumably. Absolutely. Based on her age, presumably. Uh, right. and, and I mean, now she's also being hit by talking heads over at CNN and MSNBC for being, quote unquote, too Catholic. So I don't, I don't know what that means, except it sounds really bigoted and offensive. But anyway. <laughs> Exactly. But if it was the other way around, uh -huh. if we were saying, oh, someone's too Muslim or someone's too atheist to be on the Supreme Court, then that would all hell. Yeah, absolutely. It would be headline news and on all the Sunday shows for sure. Uh, speaking of, right. of these justices, though, many conservatives, it, it's this is just a fascinating case study to me because many conservatives despise Speaker, uh, I'm sorry, Leader Mitch McConnell as a member of the swamp. And yet it seems like he's done a great job at, you know, placing conservative justices throughout the judiciary, not just with Gorsuch at the Supreme Court. So is Mitch a reason for all of this winning or is he a dangerous Beltway swamp creature? I think it's impossible to deny that he has played a large part in helping and aiding Trump's agenda. He just has. Now, is he an establishment, establishment Republican? Yes. I mean, I always think of Don Blankenship um, in his cocaine Mitch ad and talking about how, uh, you know, Mitch McConnell aids China people and that he doesn't really put America first. I think that's a, just a bunch of rhetoric that people like to say because he is an established Republican mm -hmm. in Washington. People just assume that he's a part of the swamp. But the fact of the matter is, is that he has helped Trump with his agenda. Um, I do think that I think that we can trust him to put forth a conservative justice or an originalist justice. OK, so looking ahead to the November midterms, do you sense that uh, people will be voting for who they like more or the, who they hate less? Because this is you know, a problem that we came across Ooh. in 2016. I think that's a good question. I, I mean, I, I think it'll probably be who people hate less. Um, you know, but I, I say that, but at the same time, people might might be kind of over that. Hmm. Um, I, I I don't know. It, it's kind of it's kind of hard to say. What I do think is that we are underestimating conservatives, though, who are so frustrated with what they're seeing on the left um, that they will actually get out and vote. That the resistance is actually doing more work for Republicans and conservatives hmm. than they actually are for the left. Of course, only time will tell with that. But as it as it seems right now, it looks like the blue wave is just a ripple that is crashing on the rocks of the resistance. So hopefully that works in our favor. That was a very uh, well-scripted metaphor you just laid out there. For yes, us. very poignant, just for yeah, you. I appreciate <laughs> that. You recently wrote how crazy it is that loving America is now apparently a political position. What, uh, can you explain to our audience what you mean by that? Yeah, I absolutely believe that. Um, now when you hear about someone being patriotic or loving America, wanting to stand for the anthem, which we could get on to that <laughs> whole tangent and I won't, um, but or, uh, you know, defending the military, mm -hmm. it's 
almost always a conservative or a conservative position. I'm not saying no Democrats love America. I'm not saying that no Democrats are patriotic, but it, it's just a, a matter of fact. I was on HLN the other day and I was on a panel with two Democrats, one more moderate, one super far left. Both of them said that they're not going to be celebrating 4th of July this year simply because uh, they can't stand the state of our country, which I think the state of our country right now is looking mm-hmm. pretty good, whether you like Donald Trump or not. Um, but one of the one of my colleagues on the panel said that it's because of all of the racism and all of the oppression and everything that we've done in this country from the very beginning against black people. So I think that a lot of people on the left have this perspective that we are defined by our sins and defined by our imperfections, mm-hmm. whereas I choose to believe and most conservatives choose to believe that we are defined by our ability to overcome those imperfections in such a short amount of time and just the American grit that I think is so relentless and so irreplaceable. And that's what makes our country unique. And of course, people on the left also can't answer the question, if our country is so awful, if we are ruled by this racist white supremacist patriarchy, why are you so eager to let everyone in? Why don't they stay in their awesome country of Guatemala? If if our country is so bad, then why are you so eager to let everyone into our borders? They can't answer that question. So I definitely think it's become a political issue, unfortunately. Interesting. So you tweeted something the other day that I want to read to everyone. You said, my little girl just said to me, mom, how is progress possible if our growth is stunted by perpetual tribalism and xenophobia? Wow. Literally at a loss for words. She's a German shepherd. I had no idea this was possible. Um, I, that sounds like a real woke German shepherd right there. Is this what she's... She is very woke. <laughs> she is very woke. If you haven't noticed, the Stucky household is a very woke house. I'm working on my cats. Okay. My cats seem to have this like scary libertarian bent about them. I'm Uh-oh. trying to work that out. I'm trying to show them the beauty of socialism. <laughs> Um, But quite honestly, they're bigots. They don't want to hang out with me. They don't want to hang out with the dog. Um, It just makes a lot of sense for libertarians. But (laughs) my woke German shepherd, he gets it. She gets it. I'm sorry. I was was going to say. Because she doesn't care about that I was going to say, has she identified yet as as your daughter? (laughs) Just, just. No, yeah, no, not quite. But thankfully, she understands the woes that we're facing in Trump's America. That's the that's the most I could ask for right now. She's only one. Um, and a half. Speaking of woes, you just mentioned those lefties on the uh, panel the other day when you were on TV who are not celebrating the Fourth of July. But the Fourth of July, my favorite holiday, is indeed tomorrow. Me too. And how are you going to be celebrating? Uh, my husband and I are going to go to uh, a lake and a lake house with my family, and so we'll be celebrating with. My brothers, my nephews, um, our dogs. I'm sure that we'll eat hot dogs or something like that and just enjoy a day celebrating and thanking God for our freedom because it really is so rare that, uh, you know, we're even able to do things like disagree, that we're able to worship the way that we want to worship and that we're able to take a day off work and just enjoy family without, um, you know, any fear of really anything. Mm. It's it's really amazing and I don't want to take it for granted, so... That's what we'll be well, doing. Well, be sure to throw a beer and some country music listing into that, too, and it sounds like the perfect day. <laughs> I will. I will. Thanks so much for being here with us, Allie. Thanks, Alicia. And thank you, everyone, for tuning in. I hope you all have a great Independence Day. Mm-hmm.